In the past, when there were no other options, and far fewer entertainment consumer products around, people were forced to value the music they listened to. True, you could listen to the music for free, this is the BBC, with its specially hemmed-in enclave for young tearaways. But if you wanted to own the music you loved, you were essentially forced to go into a shop and actually buy it. Today, for various reasons, not least the rise of digital technology, People consider the music they listen to as a right, which they are entitled to own for free. In this short program, I'm going to examine the history, explanation, and final destination of this point of view. So I ask you, what has iTunes ever done for us? Some while ago, I completed a video diary of the making of my last album. And although it was largely concerned with taking the piss out of myself before someone else could do it, there was a mildly serious objective to show anyone who might be interested the lengthy and somewhat tedious process and escalating costs involved in recording a full-scale music project. It appears many people today think that music recordings materialise out of thin air. So why is this? A potted and partial history of the music industry. In ancient times, if you wanted to hear music, you either had to go somewhere to listen to it, performed live, or for home consumption, you could buy the music and play it yourself. Generally, these sales benefited the publisher, but occasionally the artist would make some money as well. Then, in 1860 or 57, depending on your sources, came the very first recording by Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. That wily Edison fellow quickly followed by creating his own more commercially practical, because he was American, phonograph recording cylinder technology in 1877. Yes, virtually inaudible Welps masters would produce the magic of the brand new 78 format. Then the Berliner Gramophone Company pioneered the much improved format that we associate with recording today. In the 1930s, magnetic tape became all the rage and allowed politically dubious Germans to record their sellout concerts on this new, more durable and portable format. I'm talking to you a lot of execrable bollocks about racial purity in a much more audible format. Bollocks, 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 bollocks. Racism bollocks. Now tape would be used to record, they would then create metal discs, that would be pressed into the brittle material of shellac, which would bugger up your stylus after at least one go. You're so spectacular, but not like Dracula. I have a spatula, it's more entangular. Whilst the long player began to be fully exploited by record labels, the 45 RPM single reared its ugly head in 1949 as a commercially viable format and would shape the marketing and sales of music until the early 70s when rambling, regressive rock music would supplant this time-limited product with entire sides devoted to some sort of classically inspired musical hybrid popular with millions of spotty herberts with albums under their arms watching various older spotty herberts demolishing organs, bashing gongs and adding to their penis accenter, sorry, guitars by including extra necks for no adequately explored reason and whittling for half a decade. Yes, regressive rock was good for the LP but then came punk, which was perhaps not so good for the LP but brilliant at selling wacky t-shirts and the like. Then punk sort of went away. I blame Rod Stewart myself. After making huge profits right up to the late 70s, in the early 80s sales grew increasingly unreliable and singles were gaining in popularity, with a variety of reasons being explored by the industry, including videos, taping off the radio, taping, and occasionally the fact that there was a large amount of bollocks being recorded. Then suddenly, a CD! A brand new <laughs> space age format. Yes, the companies were delighted they got to sell all the same music all over again for exorbitant prices. But no matter, if you wanted to own the music, you had to pay. And with huge adverts like Live Aid and Mandela Day, suddenly old farts became popular again. Possibly because their music generally had wider appeal than bands like Bross. A fact the PWL Muppets, the Reynolds Girls, highlighted in their acclaimed hits, um, um, uh, well, never mind. 
in the late 1980s, Acid, a division grew between the main companies and the new upstarts producing that crazy dance music, which was essentially cheap to produce and cheap to market, as it was underground and club based. The single was back in a big way, sometimes even with 12 inches of it. Meanwhile, having reissued virtually every recorded, recognisable noise known to man and Chris de Berg, the big companies wanted to go on selling CDs and offsetting the increasingly high marketing costs by charging over the top prices. But in the old days, you only got about 10 tunes per album due to the restrictions of the format, or in Mike Oldfield's case, one track. So how could you possibly justify charging double the price for a CD? I know they thought, double the amount of material! Brilliant! Throughout the 90s, we saw an ever-increasing amount of mediocre drivel appearing alongside the one song that we actually liked. Quality control bollocks. Listen to this demo of a track you never knew existed and wouldn't care if you did. Now it might be thought that this may have led to the cherry-picking culture of the downloadable MP3 really crap sounding format when it finally became possible to download music without spending half your life trying to fit it onto your 450 megabyte hard drive. But no, say the industry, you're just bad people. Well, in some ways, I have to agree. I mean, why did everyone suddenly think they were entitled to licensed tracks with unlimited use for no money? <laughs> Having said that, I feel that for a variety of reasons, people have lost respect for popular music as a form of entertainment and art. And this I lay squarely at the doors of the tin-eared record labels, Fad obsessed tin ear DJ. Oh, Jesus. Having said that, I feel that for a variety of reasons, people have lost respect for popular music as a form of entertainment and art. And this I lay squarely at the doors of tin eared record labels, fad obsessed tin eared DJ and journalist twats. But they're about to burst out all over. Welcome to their TB debut, the absolutely brilliant Does Psycho Ranger! <laughs> Some of the micro-talented vaunted as genius by the said same tin-eared DJ and journalist twats. And oh yes, Simon Cowell. I mean, people are quite prepared to spend money on things they do actually value. The same spotty Herbert from the 70s who's happily downloading for free is also happy to fritter away a modest rip-off on a Wii Wii game they're going to get bored of after two minutes or else have to go into rehab because they have no life and have become obsessed with a girl with big tits being chased by a dragon and having to wear a variety of costumes that accentuate her big tits. But no, really, it's the intellectual power of the game that's important, not her big tits. But these same dipsticks claim they can't afford to spend 79p on a track they keep whistling at the gym interrupting the truly brilliant in-house variety pack of crap chart hits. So we need to look at these people's psychology, reason with them, explain things carefully, show them impressive facts and figures, and failing that send the bailiffs round. Let's start with a few basic questions that possibly nobody's interested in asking. How much does it cost to make a record? No, oh, seriously, how much? Well... Recording budgets vary enormously, from only the cost of the home studio equipment that you're recording on, which on average amounts to at least £1,000 up, and all the performers doing things on spec, to maybe ten or £15,000 if you're able to record in the best studios, have the best people, best musicians, etc, etc. With the rise of affordable digital recording technology, studio costs are sometimes irrelevant, depending on the genre of music you're making. Session musicians have got cheaper too, due to the declining finances of the business and the increase in self-financed projects. But if you have greater ambitions than relying on program software-based instruments and want to use live musicians, then even on the mates rate scale, costs can grow exponentially, especially depending on how good a mate they are. My last project cost around £6,000, which included one day in a bigger studio, all the live instrumentation and personnel involved, plus mastering. Even so, it would have cost me a lot more back in the 1980s, so recording costs have reduced considerably in the last 30 years. But there must be other considerations. Ah yes, marketing. Yes, the biggest problem in producing a product is letting people know about it. And this has long been the largest area of expenditure in releasing a record. 
True, with networking sites like MySpace, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and viral marketing, there are more free forms of promotion today. Still, the best way to get people to hear your track is through the traditional mediums of radio and television and generating interest in the wider media as a whole. And this still costs money! Some promotional campaigns by major labels can run into millions of pounds. And the point of all this expenditure is to get you, the public, to actually buy the record. But wait a minute. Is there a consensus in the industry itself? If somebody walks into Tower Records in San Francisco and walks out with a Metallica CD, is that not theft? You go after the individual. You do not necessarily go after society as a whole. So if we have to start knocking on doors and have to go in and confiscating hard drives in people's homes, so be it. Talking something more like, you know, 20 to 30p a track, something like that. I think that kind of, I think that's sort of on the threshold of, right, I'm not just going to copy this, I'm going to get a legit proper version here for 20p. We're only using this to play in the club. We're not making any money out of it. It's not being released as a record. It's for our own consumption only. I think a lot of people regard downloading music as just like theft, but if you're using it in a creative manner, I think it's a lot more than that. You can't steal off anybody. Just because they're rich, it's not right. You know, that's Robin Hood. And you ain't Robin Hood, mate, sitting in your bedroom. You know, when they say that it's bad for music to record companies, it sounds like a whole bunch of lawyers and accountants that don't know music talking a lot of hogwash anyway. The problem is, is that if you said note to many of these people at the record company, they wouldn't know what a note is. They, they think a note is a bank note. Here remains a problem, because some artists actually don't mind their music being distributed for free. But then let's look at the type of performers who are OK with all of this. Well, there's the kid who is still living at home and hasn't yet faced the grim cost of living. There's the plonker who wants to be famous rather than financially viable and thinks 100,000 hits on YouTube is the same thing as 100,000 sales. And most pernicious of all, there are those hugely successful artists now giving their music away and telling us that selling music is dead after years of profiting from record sales in the 70s and 80s and who are now living off the revenue of endless touring at the very material that led to them making huge revenue from endless touring. Which brings me neatly onto point number three. Number three. But can't musicians make up the difference in revenue through live performances? Well, the answer is basically no. As I pointed out, the most successful of these artists are also the ones who made the most out of record sales. Most new acts can generate a limited revenue from touring, but never in a million years what they might have made from proper record sales receipts. In the meantime, the musicians you see performing on stage, buoying up the talents of the latest pubescent nano-talent, are being paid roughly the same fee per performance as one might make at a wedding gig. The only artists paying their backing band's fees commensurate with the perceived status are those very same artists who made enormous revenue from selling records when people actually had to pay for the music they listened to. It might also be worth recognising that whilst paying 79p for a song is not going to break the bank in these financially difficult times, people might start to reconsider paying £100 to go and see their favourite artist play in some muddy field or look at a little dot on the horizon on the O2 stage. Actually, your best hope at the moment if you're an artist to make some money is through publishing. From the moment records became a viable alternative, publishing companies became the less regarded baby sibling of their parent recording labels. Now, publishing has become more relevant than ever, which is why no matter the paucity of actual writing talent, every artist is expected to come up with their own material. The manager insists on it. Joy oh joy as we see one musically illiterate vocalist after another being glued together in an unholy writing union with some poor geezer coming up with a passable backing track so the singer can pop in, hum up a rhyme and claim all the credit. A few lucky souls will get their brilliant achievement placed on an ad or in a TV programme or feature film. But none of this creates a significant enough revenue for the companies who actually financed the record and promoted it. It's fair to say that in the days of CDs, major record labels took the piss, but they're certainly paying for it now. 
as even revenues from legal digital downloads are considerably less than the profit that can be obtained through the sales of a physical medium. So in conclusion, there's no doubt that our relationship with the physical format was much stronger when vinyl was the main recorded product available. It was big and you had to handle it, and LP artwork and sleeve notes were almost as exciting as the stuff on the vinyl, or in many cases a lot more so. It's hard to get sentimental about the CD, and although the sound quality is greatly superior to MP3, the ease of digital download, and even more worrying, as it's currently entirely legal, streaming sites like Spotify, allow the user to have virtually no relationship with an artist's body of work. And as we've mentioned previously, for most of us, this is probably just as well. We've become used to liking one track, grabbing it, and discarding the artist almost as quickly. The notable exceptions are those performers whose marketing is so expensive and ridiculous that the dim-witted media is impressed, such as wearing suits made of anchovies or accidentally running nude through a hockey game. And of course the old-style bands who doggedly build up a steady relationship with their audience, playing in tiny clubs, building up a live fan base, and then upsetting them all by gaining some kind of commercial success. Occasionally an act might even grab our attention by writing a memorable song. But let's not make things too taxing, eh? But as for the charts, are they even relevant today? So here's my suggested remedies. Firstly, the punitive measure of removing a person's access to the internet seems somewhat excessive. But how about this? Charge £10 for every illegal download by getting the broadband companies to monitor their customers' traffic and collect the revenue. The money accrued could then be distributed amongst the record labels and artists through PPL. And if the broadband suppliers are unwilling to do this for some reason, then let's charge them a fixed license fee every year, estimating the level of illegal traffic that their companies are facilitating. It may make them less accommodating with regards to copyright abuse. Secondly, bring in a much larger license to be paid to the industry by streaming sites such as Spotify who are flying under the radar, claiming they are offering the same services as a radio station. This is a ridiculous assertion, as sites like these are merely access points to allow the users to call up any tune they want to listen to, store playlists in exactly the same way as one might do with an iPod, and the only difference being, you don't download the material. I'm not quite sure this is the same thing as listening to Radio 1, where a playlist you didn't ask for is constantly interrupted by a load of inane drivel. But this is unquestionably a radio station. In my opinion, a much greater effort is required from organisations like the Musicians' Union, BPI and artists themselves to inculcate a greater understanding within the general public of the impact that stealing copyrighted material will have in the long run. In particular, as so many kids want to be pop stars these days, perhaps they can have it pointed out that it might not be that much fun if 25,000 people download their song and they still get to serve the very same people in their local McDonald's. Told you it's a career. Finally, in my opinion, the charts really no longer reflect what is the most popular music around. If you ask many people, they're not even aware of what the number one is. The pop chart today has often become the repository of T4 Radio 1 bubblegum detritus, which bears no reflection on the vast array of music being listened to by anyone over the age of 12. A fact clearly reflected when the BBC realised the irrelevance of Top of the Pops and cancelled it. Two contrary ideas occur to me in order to remedy this situation. Either do away with the single as a promotional tool altogether and start getting the lazy ass radio producers and their puppet DJs to actually listen to new releases and pick the most memorable track, or encourage the public to start taking an interest in the single as a new voting opportunity, which it always has been but maybe it requires some new promotional drive in order to get people interested in choosing what will be number one again. Like actually liking the record. Anyway, to end this cheery programme, I have to reiterate one message clearly. If people want the music industry to continue providing new material for them to listen to, they are going to have to start accepting that they actually have to pay for it. Otherwise, music is going to shrink to the size of the limited ambition some fuckwit like me can come up with in their bedroom. And although sometimes these tracks might be interesting, it really isn't a large enough creative vista for people who actually like music and want it produced on a grander scale. 
then maybe nobody does. And I mean, I'll sort of, I'll patch up whatever I need to patch up.